Hello and welcome to The Take with Sophie Ridge, live at nine here in the heart of Westminster. Well, the dust is still settling from election results last week with all eyes on Northern Ireland and whether a new executive can be formed there. The DUP are refusing to play ball unless the Northern Ireland protocol is scrapped, but that could lead to another almighty bust up with the EU. Meanwhile, the Queen's speech, which tells us the government's priorities for the years ahead, it looked a bit different this time. It only happened yesterday, but there are already calls for more action on the cost of living. When will that happen? Well, we'll try and find out as we bring you takes from all sides over the next 60 minutes. I've made clear until we see that decisive action, we won't be moving uh, on the political institutions. I want that to happen quickly. We'll speak to the DUP leader, Geoffrey Donaldson, who says the Northern Ireland Protocol must go. Government at the moment would use the great powers that it has to tackle this head on. Bring forward an emergency budget. We will continue to use all our ingenuity and compassion for as long as it takes. And after Prince Charles left the Golden Throne in the Lords, the Commons had a slightly less resplendent scrap over the government's plans. We'll see what our viewers panel made of all that. Uh, here they are, well, hopefully very soon. There we go. There they all are indeed. We'll also be talking about Keir Starmer's beer gate gamble to try and get their view on that too. Hello, everyone. Little wave. We're going to come back to you uh, in just uh, a few uh, moments, so thanks for that. We'll also have some other top guests on the programme, including International Trade Minister Ranul Jawadina and Labour's Thangam Debonair as well. Uh, much more besides. All coming up on The Take. Good evening. Well, as you can tell, there is hardly time to draw breath after those elections across the country. Perhaps the most significant, though, in Northern Ireland. Sinn Féin won the most votes and the most seats on the Assembly. And now usually that means its leader, Michelle O'Neill, becomes First Minister. But it's not that simple this time, because under the power-sharing agreement, you need the leading Unionist Party to agree to form an executive and take the deputy job. Now, that is the DUP, and they say it's a no-go unless the UK government changes the Northern Ireland Protocol, the part of the Brexit deal that effectively puts a customs border in the Irish Sea. Oh, and of course, if the UK scraps the protocol without an agreement with the EU, well, then we're looking at a huge row and possibly a trade war as well. So what does the DUP have to do? Its leader, Geoffrey Donaldson, joins us now live from uh, Belfast. Thank you so much for being uh, on the programme uh, today. Uh, you've said that you won't nominate ministers to you know, form a new executive uh, until your concerns are resolved about the Northern Ireland Protocol. What exactly do you want to see happen? Well, I think it's time now, after months and months of interminable negotiations between the UK government and the EU, uh, for decisive action. Uh, we've been patient, we've waited and waited and waited, but there's been no outcome from those negotiations. And we heard last night from Liz Truss, who's leading the UK negotiating team, uh, that um, they've rejected the EU's proposals from last October. So there's, it appears there is no basis upon which an agreement is likely in the short to medium term. And in the absence of such an agreement, we believe the, the UK government should act to protect the UK internal market and Northern Ireland's place within it. So let's be clear about what that would mean. You effectively say the UK government should unilaterally act without agreement from the EU to scrap parts of the deal that they signed. I mean, that would be breaking international law, wouldn't it? And also potentially risking a trade war with the EU. Well, of course, the protocol itself makes provision for unilateral action where the protocol is causing harm, economic harm, political harm, societal harm. And it is evident, and the UK government in its command paper last July stated that the protocol is harming Northern Ireland, it's harming our economy, it is undermining political stability here. So I think in those circumstances, and in order to safeguard the Belfast or Good Friday Agreement, and the political institutions, the UK government is well within its rights to act in these circumstances. Do you really trust the UK government to act? As you say, Boris Johnson's been promising action for months. Well, I think that uh, in terms of uh, the government, um, I'm not going to take it uh, just on the basis of words. And we did have words yesterday in the Queen's speech, but we need to see action. 
And that's what I will judge the government by, uh, what action they're prepared to take to deal with the real difficulties that this protocol is causing for Northern Ireland. So on Friday, because I want to talk a little bit about what you're prepared to do, on, on Friday the newly elected Northern Ireland Assembly will meet to elect a new Speaker. Now really the Assembly can't function until that happens and it needs cross-party support to do so. Will the DUP support that election? Well, we're waiting to hear from the government. We want to see what the government has to say. Um, uh, we will meet before Friday and decide uh, our course of action in relation to uh, the proceedings in the Assembly on Friday. So I'm not in a position to say right now, but we are clear we need government action. So it seems pretty clear that you're keeping on the table the fact that you might not even support a speaker uh, being nominated for the Assembly. I, I mean, it, some would say, Sinn Féin would say, that you're effectively holding Northern Ireland to ransom. Well, of course, Sinn Féin for three years prevented not only the election of a Speaker, but uh, the appointment of an executive for three whole years, 1,044 days. Sinn Féin didn't turn up to the executive and the Assembly to do their job. So I won't take any lectures from Sinn Féin on that point. But at the same time, you know, what about the people in Northern Ireland who voted for you? Many people voted for you uh, to get, go to the Northern Ireland Assembly to help with lots of issues, including the cost of living crisis. And they might say, hang on, don't we deserve to have an assembly that's functioning? Well, of course they do. And I want a functioning assembly. But the assembly can't function in the absence of a cross-community consensus. And when I stood before the people with my party in the election, we made clear we wouldn't be forming an executive until the protocol issues are dealt with. So I have a mandate to do what I'm doing, and I intend to hold by that mandate. You say you have a mandate, but at the same time, the majority of people voted for parties who accept, or people who accept the Northern Ireland Protocol. 54 of the 90 newly elected MLAs accept the protocol. So do you really have a mandate to do this? Yes, I do, because the Assembly operates not on majority rule, as uh, because when unionists were in the majority, of course, nationalists would not accept majority rule. And therefore, at the heart of the Belfast Agreement is the principle of power sharing by consensus. And there isn't a consensus at the moment on the protocol. And we need to have that consensus. Uh, that is the basis upon which a government can be formed. That is right. Uh, that is the core central principle of the Belfast or Good Friday Agreement. It is power sharing by consensus. And not a single unionist uh, MLA elected to the Assembly last week supports the protocol. And if this situation were reversed, does anyone seriously believe uh, that uh, nationalism would be ignored, that the nationalist parties would simply be dismissed? Uh, of course they wouldn't. Their concerns would be addressed. And it's important that unionist concerns are addressed if we're to have that power sharing on a cross-community consensus basis. OK. Um, I want to talk a bit more about the uh, protocol and the Brexit deal, uh, because of it was, was obviously negotiated by Boris Johnson. Uh, he told us it was a brilliant deal uh, at the time. Uh, and I just want to play a, a quick clip of what Boris Johnson told me. This is December 2019, so around the time of when it was agreed. Let's just listen. There's no question of there being checks on goods going uh, NIGB or GBNI. So they because they're part of, if you look at what the deal is, we're part of the same customs territory. So he said there will, will be absolutely no checks. There'll be no question of there being checks on goods going NIGB or GBNI. Do you think Boris Johnson didn't understand what he was signing, or do you think he just wasn't telling the truth? Well, look, I don't know the answer to that question, Sophie. I think only the Prime Minister can answer that. But I can tell you this, that in the House of Commons, when these matters were debated, the DUP pointed out very clearly to the Prime Minister what the protocol would mean in practice. It would mean customs checks on goods moving between Great Britain and Northern Ireland. It would mean additional costs, delays, more paperwork um, for businesses in Northern Ireland. It would uh, drive up the cost 
uh, for consumers in Northern Ireland of goods that have come from Great Britain. And that has been the case. Today, the cost of living crisis in Northern Ireland is being exacerbated by the fact that it costs a lot more now to bring goods from Great Britain to Northern Ireland. The Road Haulage Association estimate uh, that the additional cost of transporting goods as a result of the protocol is 27% in the first year of its operation. That means uh, food prices are dearer here in Northern Ireland than they are in Great Britain. It means that consumers, households, hard-pressed households at the moment who are facing higher energy bills are also fa facing higher food bills because of the protocol. And that's not acceptable and that's why we're saying the Prime Minister must act. Uh, if the Prime Minister believes that the, uh, that the right outcome is that there should not be any checks on goods moving from Great Britain to Northern Ireland, then that's the outcome we all want to see. You also had an exchange with Theresa May uh, in the House of Commons uh, yesterday. I just want to play her response to you, because she obviously thinks that you should have signed up to the deal she had on the table. Let's listen. I put a deal before this House which, which actually met the requirements of the Good Friday Agreement and actually enabled us not to have a border down the Irish Sea or to have a border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. Sadly, the DUP and others across this House chose to reject that. But it was just such an opportunity for what he wanted. She's right, isn't she? There had been a lot lighter checks under her deal. Do you regret not backing it? Not at all, Sophie, because, of course, um, Theresa May's deal, the backstop, would have uh, put in place a temporary transitional arrangement whereby for uh, two years after uh, the UK had left the European Union, all of the United Kingdom would remain in the EU customs union and the EU single market. After two years, Great Britain alone would have the right to leave the customs union and the single market, leaving Northern Ireland permanently stuck in both the EU single market and customs union. Now, bad and all as the protocol is, that's a far worse outcome for Northern Ireland. That would leave a permanent uh, uh, barrier, a border, between Northern Ireland and Great Britain. We would have been outside the UK customs union. Currently, we're inside it. We would have been outside the UK internal market. Currently, we're inside it. But the protocol creates barriers to trade within the UK internal market. So that's why we need those barriers removed, that so-called REC border and to put in place arrangements that protect both the UK internal market and the EU single market. And we believe there are pragmatic solutions there uh, that, will, that will satisfy everyone's needs, but the protocol certainly doesn't do that. OK, if, just finally, if the government does take action, if you are satisfied uh, on the protocol, and I appreciate that feels like a long way away, it's a big if uh, at the minute, Will you commit to facilitating a Sinn Féin First Minister by nominating a deputy? Well, it's not a matter of facilitating Sinn Féin. We accept the outcome of the election. It is a matter of facilitating the formation of an executive. And yes, we will nominate our ministers to an executive because we want to get on with the business of government and providing good, stable government for Northern Ireland. But sadly, the, uh, uh, the long shadow of the protocol is uh, uh, leaving its mark on uh, politics in Northern Ireland at the moment. It has created uh, instability. It has undermined the very delicately balanced arrangements that were put in place uh, through the Belfast and successor agreements. That's why we need this matter dealt with. I want to see stable institutions. I want to see Northern Ireland prospering. And that means uh, the protocol has to be dealt with and decisive action is required. OK, uh, thank you uh, very much indeed. Geoffrey Donaldson there of the DUP. Thank you. Well, in a moment, we'll get reaction directly from the government, but let's first see what our senior Ireland correspondent, David Blevins, uh, makes of that. Uh, David, what jumped out to you from that interview? Well, I think it is crystal clear, uh, Sophie, that the DUP has no intention of participating in the election of a first and a deputy first minister at this point, and therefore Northern Ireland isn't going to have a government for a while. But there are two things to watch carefully, I think, in the coming days. Uh, on Friday, as you pointed out, uh, the first plenary session of the new Northern Ireland Assembly is due to take place for the election of a speaker. Will the DUP participate in that election? If not, it will be a 
signal that uh, they think this is going to uh, linger this crisis. In fact, that will deepen the crisis because there won't even be a government in a sort of shadow form in Northern Ireland. The other thing to watch for is what Sir Geoffrey himself does. He has eight days from the Northern Ireland election to resign his own seat as the Member of Parliament for Lagan Valley and occupy the seat he's just been elected to in the Northern Ireland Assembly. Again, if he chooses not to do that at this point, it will be an indication that the DUP don't expect any speedy movement from the government on the protocol. Really interesting stuff, David. Always good to talk. Thank you very much for being on the programme. Well, a little bit later in the programme, we're going to, of course, talk to our viewers panel, find out what they made of the Queen's speech and their interviews too. Uh, talking of which, it's time now to get some reaction from the government. So I'm pleased to say uh, we are now uh, joined by our next guest to talk about that interview with uh, Geoffrey Donaldson, find out what they're planning to do about the Northern Ireland uh, protocol and, of course, about the uh, cost of living as well. We're joined uh, now uh, by the Minister at the Department for International Trade, Ranil Jaya Thank you very much for being with us. So we just heard from the DUP's Geoffrey Donaldson, who was pretty clear that he is prepared to effectively block the forming of the executive or the Northern Ireland Assembly until there's action on the protocol. Is he holding people to ransom here? Well, good evening, Sophie. Great to be with you. And as you've just heard, as we've all just heard, the current operation of the Northern Ireland Protocol is disrupting that delicate balance in uh, the Belfast Agreement. And so it's absolutely right that the government's going to take action um, to protect the peace and the stability that the people of Northern Ireland need and deserve. Um, the, the truth is, uh, we agreed a Northern Ireland Protocol in good faith. And the EU have um, pursued a very legalistic approach to things. So, um, you know, they have confirmed that they're not going to change their mandate um, in uh, its current form. Uh, the, the Northern Ireland Protocol uh, is here to stay in their view. And that's undermining the Belfast Agreement. So that is why uh, we are determined to seek change. I'm really interested to find out what action you are planning on taking, because obviously I'm hearing, you know, from many people, yourself and other ministers as well, that you agree that something needs to be done. What exactly are you planning on doing? Scrapping checks between all checks between Great Britain and Northern Ireland and the Irish Sea, stopping customs arrangements, stopping filling out forms. And are you prepared to do that unilaterally? Because it does feel as if the EU, well, they've been very clear and they don't want to renegotiate. Well, look, no decisions have been taken on exactly the way forward at this stage, but it's clear to everyone that the situation is a very serious one. Um, as I say, the EU have said that they are fixed in uh, their position at this moment in time. So it is right that we uh, leave open any action that's necessary to preserve uh, stability and peace in Northern Ireland. The Foreign Secretary, of course, is responsible, and uh, you'll have to speak to her about uh, her latest work uh, in this regard. But the truth is, we've got to solve the problems here, because some of the EU's proposals don't, don't just not fix the problem. They actually make it worse. There'd be more paperwork for businesses and for the people of Northern Ireland. Um, the role of the European Court of Justice would still uh, not be addressed. And this isn't what uh, the people of Northern Ireland need. So that's why uh, nothing's been ruled out at this stage. I mean, it feels to me like you're just so far away from the EU on this that you may as well be on different planets. It's very difficult to see an agreement uh, being made in the time frame that we're talking about. So are we talking about unilateral action, which could lead, as you know, to the EU deciding to put up tariffs, effectively a trade war? Is that a price worth paying? Well, we have spent now something like 16 months trying to find solutions with the EU, with our friends and neighbours. We want to have a strong, positive relation, uh, relationship with the EU. And, you know, our command paper made clear that we're, we're absolutely prepared to carry on uh, with the checks on goods that are at real risk of entering the EU single market. That's the intention of the Northern Ireland Protocol. But the truth is that two thirds of all the checks, the customs checks around the border of the EU are now being conducted uh, on the island of Ireland. This isn't right. It's disproportionate, it's overly legalistic, and it's got to change. So we have worked hard to make the protocol work. We've spent hundreds of millions of pounds on the Trader Support Service um, and the Movement uh, Assistance Scheme. Only last week, um, though, we, we, we happen to learn that the EU is refusing to use that purpose-built IT system that we set up. So um, we've tried to make it work. We've negotiated, we've uh, tried to find solutions, and uh, you know, we will continue 
to want to seek to uh, arrive at a positive outcome for everyone involved. But as I say, it's important that no, uh, nothing is ruled out at this stage. And uh, as I say, at this moment in time, okay. no absolute decisions have been taken. OK, a bit of a, a sort of rough direction of travel, I think, there uh, emerging. Uh, now, I'm keen to talk a bit about the cost of living, because in the Queen's speech, the Prime Minister said uh, that he would be saying more about help in the coming days. This has been changed, it feels, today. He's saying now that there'll be more help in the months ahead. So what exactly is the time frame that we're talking about here? Well, um... Look, I, I think the Prime Minister is absolutely right that we will always continue to do whatever we can to help people. Um, but it's important to recognise what we've already done. Uh, we've provided um, all uh, people in uh, homes of band to, A to D uh, with a £150 uh, tax rebate uh, on their council tax. Uh, we've been providing uh, everyone uh, with a salary boost uh, through the national living wage. Uh, the lowest paid uh, workers have been getting a salary boost. And indeed, uh, others will be getting a tax cut through the NI reductions, a £330 average tax cut uh, coming later this year. For those on universal credit, we've cut the taper rate so they keep more of what they earn, uh, around £1,000 extra on average. And we've increased the size of the household support fund to £1 billion. So a lot has already been done. But it, of course, um, I understand uh, as much as anyone else that the, the cost of living um, is something that we've got to uh, continue to work on. And that's why we've got to grow our way out of this uh, through new so trade deals around the world, you, creating new jobs. You say that, you know, you understand that more needs to be done. It does feel like there is an acceptance among many uh, of uh, your colleagues that this is a huge crisis for people. Uh, people are really, really worried. Uh, and I think many people are going to be won wondering about when they can expect a bit more help. Boris Johnson has been showing a bit of ankle on this, but when can we expect it? Do you think it will be before the summer recess? Well, um, as uh, the Chancellor's already outlined, there will be this reduction to national insurance uh, later this year, which will give um, uh, the average person a £330 uh, reduction. Yeah, but in the a reduction is once you put pay. it up. To be fair, it's not a tax cut, is it? And actually, to be honest, the more people I speak to in your party, the more people seem to be saying that you would see more tax cuts. Is that something that we should be expecting, tax cuts? Well, first of all, uh, people on lower incomes will be paying less national insurance than they would have done uh, even before uh, the recent changes which are there to fund the health service. Uh, but actually, um, yes, as a Conservative, of course, I believe in cutting taxes. And the Chancellor has also outlined a reduction in income tax in due course. Uh, but importantly, as I say, we can't just um, continue um, to spend, as the Labour Party would do, spend our way uh, or try to spend our way out of every crisis. We've got to make sure that we're growing our economy. And that's why we've got a long term economic uh, growth uh, agenda, including new trade deals with countries around the world, not only Australia and New Zealand, the deals we've already agreed, but with India and with the uh, Gulf Cooperation Council, with Canada, with Mexico. These are the plans ahead that will create great new jobs for people across our United Kingdom. OK, I just want to uh, read a quote by uh, one of your MP colleagues, a backbencher, Conservative backbencher, Lee Anderson, uh, who was in the House of Commons a bit earlier. Now, he said, I think you'll see firsthand that there's not this massive use of food banks in this country. We've got generation after generation who cannot cook properly, they can't cook a meal from scratch and they cannot budget. Do you agree with Mr Anderson that there isn't a massive use for food banks in the country? It's just that we've got generations who can't cook properly. Well, uh, look, I, don't, I, I think probably what, he's be, uh, what you've quoted is being taken out of context. What I would say uh, is that uh, food banks are uh, you know, a great example of how the British people support those who are in need. Uh, of course, as I've said, we've been providing additional support through universal credit by um, improving the amount of money that people can keep that they earn. Um, and I, I'd observe um, that uh, you know, the opportunity to create new jobs and give people the security of a pay packet is actually the way forward. And uh, I, I know that those jobs that are export-led, that are trading with the world, um, are actually paid on average 7% higher um, than other jobs in the economy. So this shows that if we get out there and uh, continue to grow our economy, get people into well-paid jobs, uh, trade with countries around the world, um, we've already struck deals with something like 70 countries uh, with a, a value of something like £800 billion, pounds. That's how we're going to make sure that we're delivering not only the benefits of Brexit, but making sure that everyone uh, can live better lives in the years ahead. Uh, very quickly, because uh, I am out of time, is there going to be an emergency budget? Uh, uh, as far as I'm aware, 
um, the, uh, the Chancellor and the Prime Minister are in lockstep on this, that we will continue to provide support. This was a Queen's speech. Um, is that, is that a no or a yes? I'm still not sure. For, is for there the, going to be an emergency uh, country, budget? Uh, and the Chancellor will, of course, um, make sure that the right support is provided at the right time. Is there going to be an emergency budget? As far as I'm aware, the, the Chancellor and uh, the Prime Minister are absolutely at one and are going to provide the support uh, in the way that we've always done. Uh, making sure that um, we're creating schemes like... Are you, are you hinting at a no... I, can't, I, I genuinely can't work out if you're hinting at a no or a yes here. <laughs> Is it a no well, or a... <laughs> I can't work it out? I, I, as far as I'm aware, uh, the fact that we have put £1 billion into the Household Support Fund that's already going to local councils demonstrates we've got support, but we'll keep everything under review. Right, I think, I think that's hinting at a no. Uh, OK, thank you very much uh, for being on the programme uh, today. Much appreciated. But let's have a quick word now with our Deputy uh, Political Editor, uh, Sam Coates, now and find out what he made uh, of all that. I think that was a no to an emergency budget, but I'm still slightly confused. Well, Sophie, I'm not one often to have a great deal of sympathy with the predicament of MPs, ministers, shadow ministers that come on these shows, uh, shows uh, like yours to defend the government. But I do have a tiny bit of pity for the minister because he's here very clearly to defend the government. He wants everybody in number 10 to know he does a sterling job defending the government. The problem is nobody knows what they're defending and that's because the position changes so fast. Yesterday morning, the government weren't going to offer any more fiscal firepower, more money from the Treasury, effectively, to help with the cost of living crisis. Then in the afternoon, Boris Johnson hinted that they might, but the Treasury appeared to be somewhat surprised, somewhat aghast at the suggestion of help uh, within days. This afternoon, Boris Johnson wouldn't rule out an emergency budget, something that Michael Gove ruled out with funny facial expressions on the morning uh, TV round. And then this evening, I'm starting to get to the bottom of what's really going on. Uh, what we now expect is there probably will be another package of support, probably uh, before the summer, because I think ministers by then will have enough data about what the next energy price hike looks like. Could that include tax cuts? Well, I'm told nothing is off the table. How on earth do ministers defend all of that lot, given just how quickly their stories are having to change? Uh, interesting, yeah. Well, it's good to have you to sort of slightly unravel <laughs> where we are, because I'll, I'll be honest, with the various different pronunciations from different uh, members of the government, it is quite hard to keep It's track. why we need 24-hour news channels. Uh, yeah, exactly, quite. There you go. Good to keep us in job. Um, on the Northern Ireland Protocol, I'm also interested to get your uh, thoughts. Um, Geoffrey Donaldson, pretty clear that it, he doesn't see himself uh, trying to allow this executive to be formed in the Northern Ireland Assembly until, unilaterally or not, the Northern Ireland Protocol is got rid of. But it feels as if the UK and the EU are so far apart on this. Um, what way forward can you see? There is going to be a bust up between the UK and the EU over the Northern Ireland Protocol. What I can't tell you, Sophie, is how far is Boris Johnson really prepared to take it? Now, if we push it to the ultimate extent, then as you were saying in your interview with Geoffrey Donaldson, that could mean tariffs, that could mean difficulties in trade. That could mean the whole of critical negotiations over things like the status of Gibraltar. Is Boris Johnson willing to allow further tariffs at a point where his top priority, he tells us, is the cost of living crisis? So we will get the bust up, but what will be the consequences? And that's where the cost of living and big political projects like this over Northern Ireland start to really crash up against each other. Uh, it really does. And I guess that's going to, like, as you say, only going to become clear in these weeks ahead. But time... It is not on our side when we're talking about the formulation of that assembly. Thank you very much, uh, Sam, for talking us through all of that. You're watching The Take. We are live in Westminster. Up next, we're going to find out what the most important people, our viewers, make of the Queen's speech and more, all after this quick break. Hello, welcome back live to Westminster. This is The Take. And it's been quite a week already. We've had Keir Starmer promising to quit if he gets a fine over that curry and beer in Durham. And the state opening a parliament, no less, with Prince Charles delivering his mother's Queen's speech. So let's have a quick watch of the best bits of the week so far. And do look out for Michael Gove defending the government over the cost of living crisis in his own unique style. That's at the end of our look at the best bits of the week. As Democrats, the DUP but also the British government must accept the, and respect the democratic outcome of this election. Brinkmanship will not be tolerated where the north of Ireland becomes collateral damage in a game of chicken with the European Commission. I believe in honour, integrity, 
and the principle that those who make the laws must follow them. I'm absolutely clear that no laws were broken, but if the police decide to issue me with a fixed penalty notice, I would, of course, do the right thing and step down. Her Majesty's government's priority is to grow and strengthen the economy and help ease the cost of living for families. Her Majesty's government will level up opportunity in all parts of the country and support more people into work. We are staring down the barrel of something we haven't seen in decades. A Prime Minister whose response to the crisis was to make fun of those that were worrying about inflation. Yeah, yeah. A government of the moment would use the great powers that it has to tackle this head-on. Bring forward an emergency budget yeah. with a windfall tax. We need the legislative firepower to fix the underlying problems in energy supply, in housing, in infrastructure and in skills, which are driving up costs for families across the country. And this Queen's speech takes those issues head-on. Yeah a statement that is commonsensical, turning it into uh, a major capital letters, a big news story, um, and in fact, when the Treasury quite rightly say, calm down. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> really, really not sure why the Treasury have Scouse accents, um, but they go, uh, they do, uh, in the world of Michael Cove. Well, that was the week so far. Let's find out now what people made of it all. It's time to speak to our regular panel uh, of viewers. And here they all are. Thank you so much for being uh, with us. Just pick up my uh, cue cards there. So I'm keen to talk to you first about the Queen's speech, to find out uh, what you thought of the Queen's speech. And secondly, uh, to talk about Keir Starmer uh, and whether or not you're bothered by Beer Gate or if you're not bothered at all and what you make of his uh, pledge to resign if he's fined by the police. So let let's just... Let's crack on with the panel, uh, shall we? We can talk to Smeet Nakar uh, first. Now, Smeet, you're a Labour voter. You've been on the panel before. It's good to have you again from Leicester. What did you make of the Queen's speech? Good evening, Sophie. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, um, from my point of view, it was um, an insincere collection of words, um, bereft of ideas, uh, and much like Tory Brexit policy, it was all waffle, um, no substance. There you go. Um, pretty uh, strong words there from Smeet. Uh, John Comerford, I'm wondering if you've got a different perspective, the sort of Conservative uh, voter, a former mayor as well, I understand, former mayor of Lyd in Kent, I think, uh, I'm right in saying. Um, what did you make of the Queen's speech? Do you agree with Smeet's assessment? Yes, I do, greatly. Um, I thought it was very lacklustre. There was nothing there to help those that are struggling with the cost of living. Um, and, you know, there's just so much going on at the moment where people are having tremendous difficulty paying their bills, especially energy and things like that. And when you hear of ladies um, sitting on buses to keep warm, that's absolutely atrocious. We're in a civilised society that should not be happening. Yeah, we're referring, of course, to you know the, the things that were put to Boris Johnson about elderly people trying to keep warm, riding on buses. I can see a lot of heads... Uh, nodding there. Uh, let's talk to Stella next, shall we? Uh, Stella, Stella Findlay, you're, you describe yourself as a liberal. Um, what did you make of the Queen's speech? We've heard about people saying you know, there wasn't enough on the cost of living. What, what were your main takeaways? Uh, I think I'm liberal by default, Sophie. Okay. Um, not really by choice. It's just the best of a bad bunch, I think. <laughs> That's quite um, an important qualification. I, I thought it... <laughs> yes, I think so. Um, I, I was very disappointed. I thought it was very dull. Um, it was lovely to see members of the royal family there, but um, the content was very banal. And I think that the whole show of it could have been much more imaginative because this was an opportunity to change the format to some degree. It was already changed by the Queen not being there. Um, but I think it would have been nice to have seen the Queen. So I think that the format as it was in person could have been the same, but it would have been nice to have had the Queen on Zoom perhaps and delivering the, the Queen's speech herself. That would have been a really radical change, that. wouldn't it? 
Certainly uh, m m waking it, people it up a would, bit. It would, but why not? Yeah. <laughs> right, let's talk to Ian uh, Mucklejohn uh, next, shall we? Uh, Ian oh. Mucklejohn, Labour voter. What's your uh, takeaways from the Queen's speech? Well, it was a bit like a meringue. There was very little in it. Uh, and I think the Queen was uh, fortunate not to have to give it. Goodness knows what Prince Charles made of it. There was absolutely nothing, and there's a huge crisis brewing, and action really needs to happen. Uh, and, and for the government to say that people aren't using food banks because they don't know how to cook, goodness gracious, the time will probably come when people won't be able to afford to cook, because they won't be able to afford the power to cook it. You know, there's an argument for bringing back British restaurants that functioned between 1940 and 47 during the, during the war. Um, so, uh, no, the Queen's speech was a real disappointment. There you go. I think we've had unanimity, I think, on uh, the Queen's speech, rarely for our panel. Uh, probably worth pointing out, uh, it was a Conservative backbencher who made the comments about uh, cooking, but, you know, the point still stands about MPs, certainly. Uh, right, let's talk about our next uh, topic of, of conversation, shall we? And I'm really interested to hear what people make of Keir Starmer's um, comments, because I feel like it's one of these ones where, you know, we talk about an awful lot in Westminster, but actually finding out about what the public make of it, I think is actually really uh, worthwhile uh, to do. Uh, let's talk to Lisa Goddard uh, first, shall we? Uh, now, Lisa, you're a Labour voter. Um, what do you make about yeah. Beer Gate, if you like? What, do you think it's serious? Are you worried about it at all or not really? Uh, I think that I don't think that Keir should have had to come forward and say that he would resign. Uh, it should go without saying that you would resign if you've got a fixed penalty notice or committed a, any crime if you were in charge of the law. Uh, I'm disappointed more and more when I see the video of him at the window drinking uh, beer. I don't think that's any different from those in Downing Street that were drinking wine uh, during their working lunch, uh, but it wasn't suitcases full of uh, wine and uh, singing Abba at whatever time in the middle of the night. I, I feel a little more disappointed with, with Keir and things at the minute. I think that needs to, a little bit more work, a bit more effort. That's interesting, uh, as a Labour voter as well, but perhaps, you know, feeling a bit of frustration in, in the leader of the party yeah. at, the, at the minute. Uh, well, let's get the perspective of uh, Rob Tyler, shall we? Now, you're a Conservative voter, uh, Rob. You're based in Bolton. Um, do you agree with what Lisa's saying, or do you think you have a bit more sympathy with uh, Keir Starmer? I don't think that Keir Starmer should resign. I don't think that anyone should resign. Um, Beer Gate and Party Gate are yesterday's news, the, the yesteryear's news now. What I would like to see is our elected members working together, stopping slinging mud at each other. The real issues are going to come in five or six months' time, and they're the fuel prices and the food prices, and they've got to be tackled soon. It's going to be very easy to put them to the back of our minds as summer comes, but we need to give people peace of mind as they're going to move into a, what could be a very cold winter. Uh, Dr Paul Blom, do you agree with that? Don't, um, Rob doesn't really care about Partygate or Beergate. What's your take? Yeah, um, I, 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 yes, I think Beergate um, is, is really something which um, is being blown up by the press. Uh, I think we should move on from that. I don't, I don't think that uh, Keir Starmer really should be resigning. I think uh, he made himself a bit of a hostage to fortune, but really I think it does. there's no equivalence between what he did and what was happening in, in Downing Street and, and party game myself. Can I just say, well, just about the Queen's speech, I think the one big admission which no one seems to have mentioned, I totally agree with the cost of living wasn't mentioned, but is climate change, which I think is the biggest emergency facing this country. And there was nothing about climate change and achieving net zero in the Queen's speech, which I think was a very big admission. Uh, interesting. And I see some nodding uh, from some of our Queen's speech uh, commentators uh, agreeing with that uh, point. And finally, let's talk to uh, Aroika, shall we? Um, what do you make about Beer gate. Do you think that uh, Keir Starmer, get my words out this evening, do you think Keir Starmer was right to pledge to resign? Well, if he, if he does resign, and it's quite laudable really to decide to resign, um, it, it, it won't make any difference to how Boris Johnson is proceeding because Boris Johnson's going to lumber on and that would mean that Keir Starmer bowed out on a very honourable, you know, uh, 
guys, if you like, but but it's not going to make any difference because I don't think it's going to make change to the Conservative Party at all. I don't think that they they they. The, the, it's not going to make any difference. We'll just lose Keir Starmer. And I can't really see what that achieves. Interesting, really interesting uh, to talk to you. Very nuanced views, I thought, and in a bit of a variety of views as well. So thanks very much for coming uh, on the show uh, this week. Well, plenty for Labour uh, to think about there. And we can speak now to the party shadow uh, leader of the House of Commons, Thangam Debonair. Thank you very much for being with us uh, in the studio uh, this evening. I thought it was really interesting, actually. Uh, I don't know if you heard our panellists uh, in talking about Keir Starmer and this pledge to resign if he is found uh, to have uh, breached the law and to be given a fine. Um, do you think that, as our last um, panellist said, that you know, he has really achieved anything by offering this resignation? I think what he's achieved is drawn a contrast between him, uh, whereby he has already said he would resign if he was issued with a fixed penalty notice over this incident, which... And it just seems, as one of your other uh, panellists uh, said, to be no comparison with the Prime Minister, where there is partying on an industrial scale. There is just no comparison. 10 Downing Street during the first lockdown, where there was wine brought in in, in, in sort of suitcase loads and parties and cakes and karaoke and, and guests, there is no comparison. And I think it is a, it's a real mark of honour, and it is the man I know, Keir to be, um, that he is offering to do that right now. But I'm also very confident... I really trust in his judgment. I also know that the man's a very good lawyer, and I'm pretty sure that uh, that you know he will have also thought long and hard about what the best thing to do is for the party, for the country. But I know that his instincts are good, and that he works extremely hard. And I'm looking forward to seeing him being proved to have not committed any breaches of rules. You say that he's a very good lawyer. Do you think mm -hmm. in that case he'll have looked at the evidence and he'll be pretty confident that it's going to go one way? Otherwise, no. I, I mean that actually that he's missed the rules like all the way oh, through. I mean this this is a man who's like got the rules absolutely down. I mean he's he's had to isolate six times because of COVID tests in his own family or acquaintances. He's really painstakingly stuck to the rules at some personal cost to him and his family. So I'm saying that in, in, in the sense that he really understands the rules, he really understands the law, he always does. He's very good at being able to explain what the rules mean. One thing that I am still a bit unclear about mm. is what happens if Durham police do exactly what they did with Do Dominic Cummings. They basically say that they think that the rules were broken, but they don't issue a fine. Does Keir Starmer resign then? I mean, I think if they think that the rules have been broken, then they, they will be issuing a fine, but I don't, I don't think, think the rules have been broken. the case, because I think that Durham Police have previously said that they don't issue retrospective fines, and they obviously didn't with Dominic Cummings. Well, so it feels like it's perhaps even the most likely scenario. It, I mean, you know, they, I want the police to do their job. I know the police will be working hard to do a really thorough and objective and fair job. And when that happens, I mean, Keir, Keir has said that he's very confident because he knows what he's talking about and he knows what happened, that that's not going to happen. But if it does, then he would resign. Um, I'm, I'm not really going to get into whether or not there's a difference of emphasis there because I think that, that gets in the way of the police doing their job. Uh, OK, uh, we've been talking a lot about uh, Northern Ireland uh, on the programme today as well. Uh, Geoffrey Donaldson, the DUP leader, effectively saying that they're not going to enter this power sharing arrangement until the Northern Ireland Protocol is scrapped. Yeah. What do you make of the DUP position? Well, that's their position. I think the key person here, though, is Boris Johnson, because the Northern Ireland Protocol was his thing. He went and negotiated it. He was the one who came out waving it around, saying he'd got a deal. He needs to own it and he also needs to make it work. I'm not saying it's perfect. I think there are things they need to sort out. But this is not statecraft on Boris Johnson's part. So I think it's left all parties feeling like they're fed up, frustrated. Whatever side they're on, they need that sort of leadership to come from the Prime Minister. We're not seeing it at the moment. I'd really like him to do that because the last thing we need in the cost of living crisis, Sophie, is a trade war with our nearest trading partners. And that's what we're risking. Um, so you, you would like to see leadership from the Prime Minister. Yes. In what direction? What do you want him to do? Because they've, you know, they've hinted to say that they will unilaterally get rid of parts of uh, the Brexit deal uh, without the EU agreement, if necessary? Well, I think that's deeply unhelpful because that's basically threatening a trade war and we really can't afford to do that at a time of stagnant growth and crippling price rises. We really need Boris Johnson to show more leadership than that. There are things that he could do now which could help shift the negotiations 
if he went back to the EU and said, let's start with negotiating on vet regulations, which would help deal with some of the border crossing issues for food and animal products, that would be a start and it would be a way of getting people back round the table and saying, look, we've got to be able to find some common ground here. So whatever happens, you don't think that the UK should do anything without EU agreement, because effectively that would break international law. Is that where you're coming I from? I mean, I think it, it, agreements, that, you know, the clues in the world, it, it actually was Boris Johnson's agreement in the first place. Now, if he can't make this one work, he needs to find a way to make it and make it amended so that it does work. The last thing we need is no agreement because that doesn't benefit us. It doesn't benefit British workers, doesn't benefit British businesses. It would be a real um, damaging effect on our economy. So it's not good for us to... But all, the DUP, agreement. I guess, would argue that, you know, if... if, if if he's not going to do anything without the EU approval, that's damaging for Northern Ireland because they're having to bear the brunt of these checks. But that's what negotiations for, isn't it? And that's what statesman, uh, statesmanlike behaviour that we ought to be able to expect from our Prime Minister. That's what we ought to be seeing at this time. OK, uh, thank you very much for being on the programme. Thanks very much, uh, Thangam Debonair there from Labour. This is The Take, live in Westminster. Up next, we're going to round up everything we've just heard and also bring you some pretty interesting data about Labour's performance in those elections. Hello, welcome back live to Westminster. You're watching The Take. Well, we've had lots of takes from all sides this evening, so let's see what our deputy political editor, Sam Copes, uh, makes of it all, uh, shall we? Uh, Sam, what have you been looking at today? Well, let's start with your conversation with Thangan Debonair about Keir Starmer. Now, a lot of people, a lot of commentators have suggested that that man pledging to resign if Durham police fine him, well, that's a brave moon that uh, could basically uh, be a bit of a gamble that plays off, uh, puts him in a solid position. We've got some figures tonight that suggest it isn't quite that simple. Remember, Durham police are going to take six to eight weeks to come to their decision. And 54% of people, according to YouGov, say that Keir Starmer probably or definitely did Break the rules. 21% say he probably or definitely did not. Why is that important? Because it makes Bo uh, Keir Starmer's arguments against Boris Johnson harder because people might think he's a hypocrite if 54% of people think he probably broke the wall. Right, let's look at what people think of the gamble that he took and whether he should resign. 46% say that he should resign. 32% say that he shouldn't. Interestingly, a higher proportion of Tories think he shouldn't resign than Labour. Interesting, because actually, I think that's what we found on our panel as well. The Tories uh, seem to be a little bit more forgiving than some of these on the, uh, on the Or left. a cynic might say, just don't want the obvious knock-on effect, which is that if Keir Starmer goes, Boris Johnson will face more pressure to go. Right, let's have a look at what you've been looking at at the local elections, because this is really interesting, isn't it? Right, so we have had lots of rushed, hot takes in the media aftermath uh, of the local elections. We're not guilty, but some others are. But I thought we'd go back and have another look at some of the results and what it tells us. And what we've done is we've picked three councils, Bolton, Kirklees and Wakefield, that are, broadly speaking, areas where the Tories made gains in 2019, and then three councils, Milton Keynes, Plymouth and Worthing, where they were pretty much safe Tory areas. So let's look at what, historically, before Boris Johnson was Prime Minister, uh, the trend was. Now, what you're seeing here is which party got the highest share of the vote and by how much? So Labour won Bolton Council uh, by vote share by, by six percentage points. Labour won 40 by 14. So, so that's see, the historic yeah, position. Yeah. Tory what, traditional seats. And what happened in the next year then? OK, so let's look at what happened in 2021. You see that really Labour didn't make much progress. In fact, it went backwards in some of these areas. But in the local elections, look at this. Labour actually back to making progress in these areas, both areas in the north where they lost out in 2019 and areas in the south where they were struggling against uh, uh, in traditional Tory really areas. Really interesting. So, actually, I guess the narrative uh, that Labour aren't making the progress they need in the Red Wall, well, maybe if you compare it to 2018, but not really if you look at 2021 at all. Yeah, and so I think it, 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 it's nuanced, but it wasn't a disaster for Labour last Thursday. Uh, interesting. So, not an election-winning territory, but perhaps doing slightly better uh, than some of those hot takes uh, on the Red Wall would suggest. Sam, thank you very much for explaining uh, all of that uh, for us. Uh, always good to talk. Well, uh, plenty of takes, as always, uh, here uh, on The Take. I really hope uh, you're going to join us uh, next week. It's always a really busy show, uh, lots of fun uh, to do, uh, and plenty more coming up, of course, in the next week. <laughs>